I'm so happy to welcome you to our service today on this second Sunday of Easter, April the 19th. It's been, what, a month since we last gathered in worship. It seems like a long time ago, but through this uh, technology that we have, we've been able to keep in touch in this way uh, through these recordings and also through our Wednesday night gathering when we have a little study together. About 15 of us have been meeting that way. So we're happy through our Facebook page and through our YouTube channel that we've been able to keep in touch with you and you with me. So we like to spend this, this morning uh, looking at two readings that have been assigned for today, the second Sunday of Easter. And the first one of these is found in the Psalm, Psalm 16. I'll just read a few words from the psalm. The psalmist says, The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures evermore. Let's open in prayer. <clears throat> Christ is risen. We give you thanks, Lord, for this gift of Easter. It is beyond any of our expectations or explanations, even beyond our categories of reason and beyond any sense that we have in this physical life around us. We know about the powers of death because they do persist among us. We think especially during this terrible time of pandemic, so many have been dying, so many are under threat, and we pray, God, that the Easter message will become even more meaningful to all of us during this time. Because yours is the kingdom, not the kingdom of death. Yours is the power, not the power of death. Yours is the glory and the power. We give you thanks for the newness of life that we celebrate this day. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Second reading that I'd like to do today is from John chapter 20, verses 19 following. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. But Thomas was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. <clears throat> But he, asked, but he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of his nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples again in the house, and Thomas this time was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put them into my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, I have you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
May the words of my mouth now and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable to the Lord, our strength and our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I think there are two questions that come to me, at least, from the readings that we have, especially the John reading. What is the meaning of resurrection for you and me? And two, what, where, is the, what, where does doubt fit into our faith experience? I think the New Testament is pretty clear about the first of those questions, what is the meaning of resurrection? And I think Thomas helps us a little bit with the second. Sometimes I hear, and I, it may be a fairly common understanding, that the resurrection means it means going to heaven after we die. But is that really what the New Testament teaches us? Tom Wright says this about the resurrection. He says, resurrection was not a general word for life after death or for going to be with God in some general sense. It was the word for what happened when God created newly embodied human beings. Let's be pretty clear here. The disciples had a lot of trouble with this truth of a resurrection. They had trouble believing that Jesus was alive. Why is that? Well, believe it, they believed that the resurrection only happened at the very end of the world, when everything was completed. And they believed when that happened, they would see the patriarchs and the prophets and the martyrs all walking around, alive, resurrected. But that hadn't happened. And so, quite naturally, they're Jews, that's what they believed, that's what they're they thought the scriptures taught them, they had trouble believing that Jesus had been resurrected. And that's why they're still huddled away in that upper room, locked away for fear of the Jews. The doors are locked, the windows are shut tight, and they're all in the room except Thomas. And suddenly Jesus is standing there right in the middle of them, larger than life. And he shows them the evidence that it's him, his hands, his side, the scars, they're all visible. One of the things I wonder when I read this story, I think to myself, where did Thomas go? Any ideas? Obviously, he hasn't just gone out for coffee. One possible suggestion is that he's so devastated by what's happened that he's had trouble getting his life back together because his world has been turned upside down with the death of his Lord. And we need to remember what kind of character Thomas was. He's different from Peter and the others. He's already shown us that he's a very down-to-earth, direct, pragmatic kind of guy. He's the one that questioned Jesus. Remember that time when Jesus said, uh, don't be afraid, I'm going away to prepare a place for you, and he gives him some suggestions on what that means. And Thomas responds, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? <laughs> down-to-earth, direct, pragmatic, that's Thomas. Perhaps the disciples, when they met him sometime during that week, told him about what had happened, that Jesus had appeared, he was alive. Well, he's, he's not totally committed, not co totally believing them. Um, he, he's debating whether he'll go join them again. And we wonder what it was that moved him from doubt to faith. Well, the following Sunday, they're all in the same place. Doors are locked, windows are shut. 
but this time Thomas is with them. And just as if someone had pressed the replay button, Jesus is again in the middle of them. Thomas is asked by Jesus to secure his proof. Jesus says, thrust your finger in here, check out my wound with your whole hand. Don't doubt me, Thomas, I am real. Do you hear the tone of voice? <clears throat> it sounds to me loving and empathetic, endearing, not judgmental. I think that's the same tone of voice that might try to encourage us. You see, my hunch is that very few of us have ever lived without doubt. It's simply part of our experience as human beings and as Christians. And we've said it many times that most of us, at some time or another, are holding on to faith just with our fingernails. So I think we can completely identify with Thomas and his skepticism. And I'm happy to make him my patron saint. I know, I know Thomas had a huge advantage over us. Thomas saw Jesus with his own eyes. He had his proof standing right in front of him. We, on the other hand, have no such proof. Remember what Jesus said to Thomas? Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. I think that's us that Jesus is talking to, talking about. I think last week I mentioned that amazing experience that Gail and I had when we visited the garden tomb in Jerusalem. we were able to walk right in to that tomb. It's not a huge space. Breathe in the air and feel the emptiness where Jesus had lain dead for three days. He had not simply died and gone off to heaven as a soul or a spirit. He had been resurrected, a spiritual body that was able to walk right out of that tomb. And he was at pains to tell his disciples that he was not a ghost, but a real, live person. Now there's something unique about that body he is able to walk through walls. He defies the laws of gravity. And apparently, time and space. And all the atomic structures that surround us. He defied all of those in that new body. He appears and he disappears at will. There, are, there is no physical obstruction that blocks his path. And yet, in spite of that, he is recognizable as the Jesus they knew. And he can be touched, and he can even eat food when it's offered to him. So what does resurrection mean? Well, in Jesus' case, it means a new body. And according to the New Testament, this takes us to the very heart of faith. Because without resurrection, Paul says we are just as well to adopt the pagan philosophy, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Jesus opens up for us and for the whole human family the hope of a real bodily 
existence in the life to come that God is preparing for us. In the meantime, this faith ought to energize us. This hope, this truth is able to motivate us to spread good news. It was at the heart of what the New Testament tells us the disciples preached. And may Thomas remind us in our story the doubt that is common to all of us is not the end of our faith, but the creative underpinning of that faith. On this second Sunday of Easter, may it be for you and for me an opportunity to renew our faith in this risen Christ who comes to us just as he does to, did to Thomas to remind us that he is with us and for us The psalmist said, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. In other words, you hold my life. 